I, Connor Dixon, was planning a move to a new city, the one where my beloved cousin Jeremy lived, and to figure it all out, I took a long weekend trip there. The original plan was to stay with Jeremy, but his wife's whole family decided they wanted to visit me at the same time, so I was moved to the Hilton Hotel. It wasn't difficult. One of the few problems I didn't have in life was money. My main problem was the lack of a decent female society. I seemed to be attracted to all the wrong types of women, which usually resulted in either anger, frustration, misunderstanding, or heartbreak on my part. Since Jeremy didn't like spending too much time with his wife's family, he and I hung around while I looked for places to live and set up my law practice. My practice is such that I rarely have to meet with clients in person so I can live and work anywhere where I am a member of the state bar. Saturday night, Jeremy and I went to a party thrown by one of his business partners, Tom Baring. The party was typical for people in their 30s except that he had a large dance floor in his furnished basement that was used frequently. There were a few single ladies there, and I'm a decent dancer, and I like to dance, so I was very busy. However, there was one thing that was unclear. Tom's wife, Susan, seemed to be something between a maid and a quiet woman. She didn't seem to have anyone much to talk to, and was mostly working, making sure all the drinks were available. She also seemed to put up with a lot of crap from Tom, who I immediately disliked. I noticed Susan primarily because she was wearing a nice dress, not fancy, just cute, while most of the other women were wearing jeans or shorts. Susan's face wouldn't have launched a thousand ships, and her clothed body wouldn't have inspired a sculpture by Michelangelo or da Vinci, but she was a more than decent-looking woman. The old phrase, I wouldn't kick her out of bed, came to mind for some reason confusing me because I didn't like thinking about women in that way, especially married ones. Finally, when there was a short break in my dance card, I noticed that Susan went to the kitchen for more snacks. I was introduced to her when we got to the venue, and she said the only word I really heard from her all evening, hello. I followed her into the kitchen and said, without startling her, Susan, it looks like you're working too hard and not having fun. Can I help you with anything? In case you don't remember from our brief acquaintance, my name is Connor. She looked not just into my eyes, but it seemed into my soul. Her eyes were so dark, they seemed almost black before answering, Thank you. Then she began to wash the glasses in the sink and asked, Can you wipe them? I took a kitchen towel and started drying. I tried to engage her in conversation, and although she answered questions, the responses were brief. Not unfriendly, just very brief. And her responses to statements were usually just a head nod or a smile, rarely words. After we washed all the glasses, I helped her put a few more snacks on plates and then took half the plates and glasses to the dance floor and bar. A little later, I asked her to dance. She refused. Tom doesn't like it when I dance. This was probably the longest sentence she said that evening. Too bad. I giggled and led her to the dance floor. She was an athletic dancer and seemed to enjoy it. But at the beginning of our second dance, Tom walked up to her and ordered her to get him something. She shrugged and left. I was angry, and if he hadn't been the owner and one of Jeremy's colleagues, I would have intervened. Sometime later, I found Susan alone in the kitchen again. I turned her towards me and asked, Why do you let Tom treat you like that? You seem to be a wonderful woman. You shouldn't let him treat you harshly. She smiled and simply answered, It's difficult. Could you help again? I willingly completed one more task for her, and after that she actually came to me. Where did you stop? She asked, for the first time, starting a conversation not only with me, but with everyone I was watching. At the Hilton on Grand Street. How did you know that I was just visiting? Jeremy introduced you, she smiled, then shocked me with another question. Does your room have a view of the lake? Yes, a wonderful view. So the number is even. On what floor? This is room 810. You must be familiar with the Hilton Hotel, I answered with a smile. She smiled back and then went off to do some other things. As Jeremy and I left, I said goodbye to Susan.
Tom was drunk at that moment and was unlikely to remember what I said to him, so instead of thanking me, I simply muttered, You're an asshole. I think Susan heard me. At least I think that's what made her smile. Jeremy and I went to a local hangout, played some pool, and then I headed to my hotel. I had taken a shower and was only in my underwear, getting ready to go to bed when there was a knock on my door. I looked through the peephole, but all I could see was what looked like a woman's hair. I opened the door a crack and was shocked to see Susan. She was wearing a cloak. Susan didn't say anything when I asked, Hi, Susan. Why are you here? Instead, she opened her cloak, revealing a very beautiful naked body, much more beautiful than it looked when she was dressed. It took on its intended shock value. While I was in a stupor, she simply walked past me. By the time I closed the door and my mouth wide open, although my eyes remained wide open, she was wearing nothing but high heels. She grabbed me by the neck, kissed me hot enough to set off the fire alarm, and slid one hand into my boxers. What happened was the strangest sexual experience of my life. As far as I remember, not a word was spoken. There was a lot of moaning, squealing, and excited exclamations, but no real words. Susan was the most uninhibited and energetic sexual partner I have ever had in my life, or even dreamed of. When we both reached the finish line and stopped moving, they were completely empty. We somehow separated our connecting parts and, given the hour and intensity of our coupling, either fell asleep or passed out. Some unspecified amount of time later, I felt activity in my crotch. I looked down and saw Susan, and again crazy sex. I soon released the second heaviest weight of my life, and we both collapsed onto the mattress. I was in the twilight zone and didn't realize it when Susan apparently got up, put her coat back on, and left. I felt cold lying on the bed. Finally, I crawled under the covers and fell into a deep sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I was sure it was just a dream. The only thing that convinced me that it was real was that there was a note written in lipstick on the dressing table. The note had a smiley face and one word, Thank you. I struggled to remember whether Susan had spoken at all the previous evening during our revelry. I couldn't remember her uttering a single word. But if her actions were words, they could fill a book the size of Tolstoy's War and Peace. The next day, I was practically in a trance. Jeremy and I looked at a few houses and offices together, but I was really far from it. He must have asked me half a dozen times. What the hell is wrong with you, Connor? I came up with some lame hangover excuse, despite the fact that I had probably had a total of two beers the night before. However, in reality, I had a hangover. Sexual hangover. As I drove home Monday morning, all I could think about was my sexual encounter with Silent Susan. Even though I dated at least a dozen women who were better looking than Susan, sex with her was a light year better than any other sex I'd ever had. I should have felt sad and guilty that I had sex with a married woman, something I had never done before and intellectually and morally despised. Instead, all I felt was excitement. For the next month, preparing for the move, I was emotionally exhausted. Except when I was working or exercising intensely, I thought about Susan. It took a month after I moved before I pulled my head out of my ass and started looking for a sorority in my new city. I made it a rule never to pass by Susan's house or try to contact her. I really liked my new city. After about three months of being there, I was making even more money than before. The environment was invigorating, and I made several friends, both male and female. I've been on a few dates, but nothing that really rocked my boat. It was almost three months into my new home when I went to a party without my date at Jeremy's house. I was having a pretty good time when Tom and Susan walked through the door. When I saw Susan, my thoughts immediately went back to my heavenly experience in room 810 of the local Hilton Hotel. She looked exactly the same as she did at her party, although the dress was a different color and her hair was more elaborate. I waited until Tom had a couple of sips of strong liquor, and as Susan stood alone at the side of Jeremy's small dance floor, I approached her. Hello, Susan. I smiled. Hi, Connor, she replied with a smile. Don't you want to dance? I asked, holding out my hand. She simply nodded her head. Yes, smiled, and took my hand. 
we actually danced until we dropped. Susan was less uptight than at her party because she didn't have to worry about keeping the snacks and drinks fresh, and she was an even more energetic dancer than I remembered. After about 45 minutes of fast dancing in a row, when we were both very sweaty, I said, let's take a break. What would you like to drink? Soda, was her answer. She stayed where she was until I brought her a glass, which brought a big smile to my face. Does Tom ever bring you drinks? I asked, sipping beer. I'm bringing Tom a drink, she replied. After some more interaction in which she gave her typical short answers to questions and mostly body language in response to statements, I chuckled and remarked, You're not very talkative, are you? She smiled widely. For some men, it's a dream not to be around a talkative woman. I believe in actions, not words. We danced some more, and I took her along to talk to different people at the party. She seemed pleased to be included in the conversation, although she still didn't say much. As the party began to end, she excused herself and went to look for Tom. I was about to leave when she came up to me and asked, Can you help me with Tom? He passed out. Of course, I smiled. I found Tom passed out on a glider on Jeremy's porch. Since it didn't matter before, I never mentioned my size but I'm big and fit enough that I could throw his roughly 80 kilos over my shoulder fireman style, walk to his car, and put him in the back seat pretty easily. Being as verbose as I had ever heard her speak, Susan asked, could you please follow me home and take it to our house? No problem, I smiled. Getting a dead drunk Tom out of the back seat was harder than getting him out of a party at Jeremy's house, but still doable. Where do you want to put it? I asked Susan. Please, to the master bedroom on the second floor, she announced, opening the doors for me on the way. As soon as I laid him on the bed, she and I left the bedroom and closed the door. At that moment, she attacked me like a bitch in heat. After about two minutes of passionate kissing, she said, shower. I truly believe that the word shower was the only real word she spoke for the next 90 minutes, although she made a lot of sounds. After we had sex the second time, I sat on the bed in her guest room and she looked at me. I was practically comatose when I reached the finish line. She followed me and screamed in ecstasy. In the end, we rested and lay side by side, lazily caressing. After a delightful period of joyful stupor, she said, Tom sometimes wakes up after two hours of sleep. It's probably time for you to go. That was the most I had ever heard from her since I met her. After I got dressed and we kissed goodbye, she said, If you want me to stay at your house on Wednesday evening, give me your address. Since the sex this time was... It's almost impossible to believe. Even better than the first time, I answered, 902 Chardonnay Court. After another quick kiss, I walked out the door. I wasn't entirely sure that Susan would show up at my house on Wednesday, but to make a good impression if she did... I professionally cleaned my house and put new sheets on my bed on Tuesday. When I pulled up to my house around 5.30 on Wednesday, Susan was standing on my porch with a big smile on her face. When I approached her, she gave me a short but passionate kiss. I thought I'd order something Chinese for delivery after we eat dessert, she chuckled. Dessert was her latest attempt to rip my manhood off as she rode me with the skill of an Olympic dressage champion. We exchanged caresses in post-coital bliss. I'll order something Chinese now, she chirped and reached for her phone, dialed the number on speed dial and ordered exactly what I wanted. I wondered how she knew what I wanted. Susan insisted on paying the delivery guy for the food, and I delivered the refreshments. She confirmed my suspicions that she did not drink alcohol. I don't want to lose my head was her excuse. I laughed to myself. What do you think, if not wild, is showing up in my hotel room to have sex and then having sex in your house with your husband in the next room? After dinner, I invited her to watch a Netflix movie so our food had a chance to digest. Although, as usual, she didn't say much in response, it was obvious that she was pleased. She was very touched when we hugged while watching the movie. When the movie ended, she gave me another one of her patented passionate kisses, and quickly undressed. After a shower, another round even better than the previous ones, 
some talking in bed where she again mostly briefly answered questions and used body language to answer statements, we fell asleep in each other's arms. I woke up sometime early in the morning, I think my alarm clock said something like 3.30 a.m., and had another round. I had a really nice finish, and apparently she did too. We fell asleep again in each other's arms. When I woke up, Susan wasn't next to me, but her clothes and small purse were still in my room, so I assumed she hadn't left. Also, the smell of cooking bacon woke me up. When I walked into the kitchen, bacon was cooking on the stove. Susan looked up from the notepad she was writing in and smiled. I can make you an omelet, she said, straightening up with her naked body and kissing me again. I'll help, I smiled, kissing her again. Naked, we cooked a cheese omelet together. I asked her a few harmless questions with her typical short answers until I asked, What did you write in your notebook? I was just doing some enthalpy calculations for a modification to the advanced BWXT nuclear reactor I'm working on, she replied, while skillfully flipping our omelet using only her wrist. What did you say? I laughed. She repeated what she had just said. After the second time, I was no less puzzled. Why would you do... No matter what you say you're doing, I asked, as she transferred the omelet from the frying pan to two different plates using a spatula. This is part of my job. I'm a nuclear engineer, she answered matter-of-factly. At first, I thought she was joking, but since I had no idea what enthalpy was or what a BWXT advanced nuclear reactor was, I didn't laugh. Instead, I asked, where did you study? After eating a few slices of bacon and half an omelet, she began to actually talk rather than just answer questions or respond to statements. By the time we were both finished, I realized she was a fucking genius. Although she was only 27 years old, she received a doctorate in nuclear science and engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and worked in the field for six years. In fact, once she started talking about her job, I don't think she stopped for 20 minutes while we finished breakfast. Washed the pans of bacon and scrambled eggs together and put our plates and cutlery in the dishwasher. In the end, she concluded, Well, that's what I do in a nutshell. Sure, I understood about one-ten of what she said, but it was clear that she was a freaking genius. Kissing her in the kitchen, I asked rhetorically, So you're a genius? Actually, with your help, I'm becoming a genius at sex. She grinned back and then insisted on one more time in bed before we both left for work. For the next four months, I typically met with Susan twice a week for sex. She was always mostly silent unless we somehow broached the topic of nuclear fission or fusion. Then she turned into a talker. Having Susan drive me unconscious twice a week made me a sexually happy guy, so I had few other dates. Then, during one of her sleepovers at my house when Tom was out of town, I looked at her sleeping after another amazing sexual encounter. I noticed a few bruises on some parts of her body and wondered if Tom had hurt her. I became suspicious because when I asked her about Tom's physical abuse of her in the past, she never gave a real answer. I suddenly admitted to myself that I had feelings for her, and although I hated her husband more every time I saw him because of the way he treated her and what an asshole he was in general, I also came to the conclusion that I, too, was an asshole for having sex with a married woman. I didn't sleep much that Monday night into Tuesday morning, mostly staring at the ceiling, holding Susan close to me, although, of course, we were still going to have divine morning sex. But I decided I had to do something. Susan shocked me at breakfast when she seemed to read my mind. Don't you think you should invite me to live with you, Connor? She asked. It was the longest sentence she had ever spoken in front of me that wasn't about her work. You're married, I answered. You have to get me out of this, was her quick response, and then she kissed me and ran out the door. I spent all my free time from work on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday thinking about Susan. I tried to call her on her cell phone, but the call went to voicemail and she didn't call back. On Thursday evening, three men and one woman unexpectedly came to me in suits. One guy, Arnold, introduced himself as Susan's boss. Another, Patrick, was from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Rockville, Maryland. A third guy, Agent Stoll, was an FBI agent, and the woman Astrid was a family law attorney. 
We're here to talk about Susan Baring, Arnold said. Can we come in? Of course, I replied, leading them into my living room and offering them drinks, which they all refused. Let me get straight to the point, Arnold said. As you may know, Susan is a genius and is very important to our project to design a nuclear reactor that avoids most of the problems of the existing BWR and PWR nuclear reactors. I was proud that from my conversations with Susan, I actually knew what BWR and PWR were. I really know that, I smiled. Well, we need you to save Susan. Right now, she is at Mercy Hospital. She was beaten by her husband, he continued. What? I exclaimed. Obviously, this is the reason why I was unable to contact her. Because she is a Tier 1 federal contractor, we have him under arrest and he will not be released on bail, Agent Stoll added. Susan hired me to file for divorce, which I intend to do tomorrow, Astrid intervened. I already have the papers prepared. How can I help you? I asked. Susan would like to stay with you while she recovers. My company will pay for help during the day if you take responsibility at night. She's not helpless. Just broken, Arnold continued. But she trusts almost no one, except you. Then Arnold shocked the hell out of me. I'm afraid that my company is largely responsible for Susan's predicament. Susan had never had any sexual contact before she came to work with us, as she was very quiet and shy, and was always the youngest student in her class throughout her training. She began to show signs of depression, and she was so valuable to us that we arranged for Tom Baring to look after her. Apparently, the people who vouched for Tom, I didn't know him very well myself, either didn't really know him or didn't have Susan's best interests at heart. I actually saw a tear in Arnold's eye, and Patrick patted him on the back before he continued. Apparently, Susan only agreed to marry Tom because he was the first guy to show real interest in her, and she was single. As you can see, things didn't work out with Tom, but she lights up like a Christmas tree every time she talks about you. She said that your approach to sex is infinitely different from the way it was with Tom, the only person she's had sex with. And if you have any feelings for her, we ask you to accept her to see whether a long-term agreement will work with you. She says that in the less than a year that she's known you. She's had more sex with you than in the entire three-plus years of her marriage to Tom. I admit I was shocked. The enthusiasm and joy with which Susan had sex led me to believe that she was experienced. Now I was told that she wasn't like that before we met and that she had real feelings for me. While I was still trying to process what Arnold had said, Patrick began to tell me how valuable Susan was to the nuclear community when I politely interrupted him. I don't need an advertising campaign, Patrick. Before you arrived, I was trying to come to some kind of decision about Susan. Break up with her because she's married, or try to convince her to get rid of that asshole, Tom. The current circumstances are very close to forcing me to commit myself to her. I'll tell you what. I'll go see her in the hospital right now, and after I talk to her, I'll call you, Arnold, to tell you about my decision. Everyone around was smiling. Do you mind if we look around your house to see where we could put a hospital bed for Susan and what rooms need to be equipped for nursing care? Asked Astrid. No, go right now. I smiled, taking the car keys off the hanger in the kitchen where I keep them. Just make sure the front door's locked when you leave. I shook hands with all four of them and then got into my car and drove to the hospital. Susan's private room was guarded by a policeman, but he quickly determined that I was allowed to see her, so I walked past him without any problem. I was stunned by her condition. She had two black eyes and other marks on her face and neck. One leg was twisted and one arm was in a cast. Although her eyes were closed, they immediately opened when I lightly stroked her cheek. Even though it seemed like it was painful for her to do it, she smiled when she saw me. Do you only need me for sex, Connor? She asked, her smile turning into concern. No, although sex with you is the best of my life. I love being around you, Susan. Maybe I'm even in love with you. I'm in love with you, Connor. You treat me much better than any other man, including my male relatives. Besides, I was never very sensual before I met you. Now I think about sex with you at least once an hour during the day. Will you let me live with you for a while? If in a couple of months you don't want me around anymore, I'll leave without any hassle. That would be great. I grinned and kissed her very tenderly on the lips, 
Her smile lit up the room. We then went on to have an hour-long discussion about our goals in life, our views on children, our backgrounds, and much more. The almost silent Susan was no longer silent. The nurse finally sent me away, saying Susan needed to get some sleep. After my first visit to the hospital, things moved quickly from a dead point. Susan was discharged three days later into my care. She signed a document Astrid prepared that made me more or less her guardian until she was better, with access to her finances if I needed them, which I didn't. I ended up enjoying caring for Susan as she recovered. This was due in no small part to the fact that as soon as the day servants had left, we were caressing each other. After about a week, one of her legs no longer hurt, and the bruises had healed enough for us to have sex, as long as we were careful. So that's what we did, as often as humanly possible. Susan was a full-time outpatient within three weeks of coming to my home. We got rid of the hospital bed, fired the day nurses, and she went back to work part-time. We enjoyed almost constant body contact when we were together. One Saturday afternoon, five months after Susan had gotten back to normal. Well, not her old normal when she hardly ever spoke, but her post-hospital normal when she liked to chat with me. She plopped down on my lap and said, Connor, we need to talk, and not as well as I would like. I want to tell you that I am a nymphomaniac. Are you a nymphomaniac? I faked a gasp. So that's why my manhood always hurts. Bad Connor, she said, lightly slapping me on the shoulder. Bad boy. Okay, now listen. My divorce is next week, and I want your children. What are you going to do about it? Hmm, I said, stroking my chin. Will I be able to have sex with you with the same frequency if we get married? More often, because I won't hold back anymore, she chuckled. Damn it, you mean you were holding back? I pretended to gasp again. I'm not sure I can do more. You'll learn, she grinned. Fine. Will I still be able to have you when you're pregnant? Perhaps even more. I have a feeling that, unlike many pregnant women, my libido will most likely increase, she chuckled. So, in other words, you plan to love me to my early death? I giggled. Not to the grave, just to constant euphoria. Okay, I said after a long pause. Let's get married. So can I throw away my birth control pills? On our anniversary, I chuckled. Here's what we did. We got married. Our first child was born on our two-year anniversary. Our second was born just before our four-year anniversary. Our third and final one was born just before our six-year anniversary. Susan then had her tubes tied. I wasn't getting any younger. And her constant sexual demands during pregnancy were wearing me down, but in a completely joyful way. Somewhere along the line, two dogs appeared, and Susan received a $400,000 bonus when she completed the development of an advanced nuclear reactor. The demonstration reactor performed even better than anyone else had predicted. With three kids, two dogs, a husband who wanted to fuck her every chance he got, and a full-time part-time job as a nuclear engineer, Susan was no longer quiet. She's a chatty cat. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.